See this? This was a sticker that was placed on the cover of biology textbooks in Cobb County, Georgia. I would like to say, did the Board of Education know about them? But it was approved by the Cobb County Board of Education. Oh my. Please subscribe. Do you know if you were to take the sentiments of that sticker and you were to look at the evidences for evolution with an open mind and you study them carefully and you critically consider them, you would unquestionably have no doubts whatsoever that despite being labeled as a theory, evolution is undeniably the most compelling explanation for our existence. Thanks to the substantial volume of evidence substantiating its validity. What you would find is these evidences don't prove evolution at all. But I just said evolution is the most compelling explanation for our existence. You're not paying attention. Here are six supposed evidences for evolution that simply are not good reasons to believe in evolution. Oh, a list. I love a good list. But based on what I know about creationism, I'm pretty confident that what you consider to be six reasons not to believe that evolution is a thing, even though belief doesn't really come into it, I'm fairly confident that they will all be reasons to accept that evolution does a very good job at explaining how we got here. Number one, vestigial organs. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, vestigial organs. <laughs> penis. I mean, penis. In 1865, a German anatomist named Robert Weidersheim said that he discovered 185 different useless or virtually useless organs in the body. Now, I quite often find the people I make videos about really confusing, but it usually takes a lot longer than this. You do understand that vestigial organs are anatomical structures present in an organism that have lost or significantly reduced their original function through the course of evolution. I only ask because we're only on number one and you did say that your list was gonna disprove evolution, but the first thing that you think disproves evolution actually supports it. And he said this was evidence of evolution. Well, yay me in that case, because it does. For example, nipple. <laughs> I'm going to have to pick a different vestigial organ, preferably one that doesn't make me giggle like a six-year-old. Carry on and I'll think of something else now. In fact, the argument goes that if humans evolved, then they would have had at one time organs that an animal would have used in a certain way, but would no longer be used in that way in the human body, and those organs would begin to atrophy and start to be useless. Well, yes. What the hell's going on? Vestigial organs can undergo a process of atrophy, which refers to a reduction in size, function, and overall development of a particular organ or structure. Now, over time, as an organ loses its original purpose and functionality, it may undergo changes that lead to atrophy. The extent of atrophy can vary among different vestigial organs and species. In some cases, vestigial organs may become completely non-functional and shrink in size or even disappear entirely. Atrophy of vestigial organs is a common occurrence in the evolutionary process as species adapt to new environments and lifestyles, rendering certain structures unnecessary. The problem with this vestigial organ idea is that there are two reasons it cannot prove evolution. I've got two reasons for you, pal. Men's nipple. Oh, look, okay, fine. I know men's nipples technically aren't vestigial organs, but it's fun to say. Nip, nip, nippity nipples. Right, now that I've got that out of my systems, men's nipples are a byproduct of early embryonic development and do not really have a specific purpose in males, which has nothing to do with anything we're talking about, I know. So I suppose I better stop messing around and listen to what this guy's got to say. If you did have vestigial organs in your body, that wouldn't prove evolution. Uh, if we did? What about the appendix and wisdom teeth and the coccyx, otherwise known as the tailbone? How can you say if we had vestigial organs? We all do, except for maybe those who've had them removed for medical reasons. You see, evolution has to go from a single cell organism to a human and you don't need organs that are decaying and atrophying. You need evolution to produce new organs. Now listen, you organ boy. I'm trying my best to be serious, and if you keep saying organ, then it's going to be tricky for me to act my age. 
But what about increased brain size and cognitive abilities, which might not be the best example given the fact that you think God did it, but over the course of human evolution, our brains have undergone significant enlargement and complexity. This expansion has contributed to the development of advanced cognitive abilities, such as language, problem solving, and abstract thinking. And those things set us apart from other species. We should find wings that are almost ready to allow organisms to fly that can't yet fly. In human beings, but we didn't evolve from things that could fly. And why would vestigial wings be any different from a vestigial tailbone or coccyx? You wanna be posh. I hope you're not gonna try and claim that human beings don't have any vestigial organs at all, because that would be really stupid. We should see things adding information, not losing genetic information. Ah, yeah. But what if we needed to lose something in order for us to be better suited to the way we live now? Evolution giveth and it taketh away. Sometimes it'll add things. Sometimes it'll take stuff away. This is going really well. What do you think? Let me know in the comment section below. <laughs> and the second problem with the vestigial organ argument is that that 185 list of vestigial organs, it began to dwindle. Now, I did try to look up the number of vestigial organs the human body has, but with the internet being the internet, I'm finding lots of different answers. And as far as I can see, while trying my best to be accurate, there are somewhere between six and 180 of them. So in simple words, vestigial organs mean that an organ has lost its function. Vestigial organs will continue to exist before they degenerate or disappear in the process of evolution. Now, if I were a creationist, I would be trying to move on from this particular topic. It isn't going to help you as much as you seem to think it is. Number two, the idea of homology. We're told that similarity proves ancient ancestry. And what I simply mean by that is we're told that because humans have similar physical characteristics to certain animals, that proves that they evolved from animals. Way to oversimplify things, pal. Humans share a significant amount of DNA with great apes, which includes chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans. Based on the most recent scientific research, it's estimated that humans share somewhere in the region of 98 to 99% of their DNA sequence with chimpanzees and bonobos. And this high degree of genetic similarity reflects our close evolutionary relationship with these primates. Well, similarity doesn't prove evolution at all. In fact, you could see things that are similar and you would realize that those similarities are often caused by a common designer. Watch me make an argument, grow up and give me another. If you don't have anything useful to say, then don't say anything. Suppose there were a supernatural intelligent designer and he created a world where many organisms would need to drink the same water, eat the same kinds of food, walk over the same types of terrain. What would happen? The ones most suited to those tasks would come out on top. Imagine this, if you will, a race, we'll say between five people. And one of those people was a lot fitter than the others. He trains more. He eats better. He would probably survive, wouldn't he? Well, the same thing you doofus, because whether you like it or not, survival of the fittest is a thing. Well, obviously, he would use similarities, similar structures to accomplish his goals. Similarity doesn't prove common ancestry. But evolution isn't the most plausible explanation because we look similar to great apes, is it? Nobody is saying it is, except for creationists. And they only say that in a frantic attempt to try and debunk evolution. How's that going for you? Not that well if this video is anything to go by. Supposed evidence for evolution number three, the fossil record. Why do they always have to say supposed? It really gets on my threepenny bits. Anyway, the fossil record provides a wealth of evidence that supports evolution, combined with other lines of evidence from comparative anatomy, genetics, and molecular biology. The fossil record contributes to our understanding of the patterns and processes of evolution over millions of years. <laughs> yeah, right. Supposed. It. You know what we're told is that you can look into the fossil record and you can find proof that organisms evolved over millions of years. In fact, evolutionist Mark Ridley 
stated that no real evolutionist, whether gradualist or punctuationist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. I know just the man to answer that question. I recognize that name. Hold on a second. Okay, so I just Googled Mark Ridley, and uh, he is an esteemed evolutionary biologist who writes textbooks, college textbooks, about evolution. So you're telling me that the person who literally studies and teaches this stuff for a living doesn't buy it or, or doesn't believe in a big major chunk of it? Let's look up that quote really quick. Okay, so it looks like that is a real quote. It's from an article in New Scientist from 1981, 40 years ago. When was Tiktaalik discovered? Tiktaalik was discovered in 2004. Tiktaalik is one of the most famous transitional fossils in history. So this was 20 years before that. So this guy said in the 80s that we don't have enough transition fossils. We've gotten some since then. We've gotten quite a few. And it looks like you didn't even read the whole quote. He goes on to say, so just what is the evidence that species have evolved? There have traditionally been three kinds of evidence, and it is these, not the fossil evidence, that critics should be talking about. The three arguments are from the observed evolution of species, from biogeography, and from the hierarchical structure of taxonomy. So he isn't saying that the fossil record is untrustworthy or wrong. He's saying it's not the best evidence that we have, and we should be talking about these other three really good ones. So you didn't even read the whole quote, and the quote's outdated. So either you don't know what you're saying, or you're just deliberately being dishonest here. Either way, do better. Thanks, Forrest. I would have said exactly the same thing. What? I would have. But I like Forrest, and I know he's always wanted to be in a video with me. <laughs> you keep telling yourself that. Number four, the idea of mutations. We're told that mutations prove you could get a certain single-celled organism to mutate over multiplied millions of years and bring about new information on a grand scale that given enough time, you could get a human being. What's the problem with that line of reasoning? The problem is that mutations don't give us new information. Mm, I think you may have just misspoken. I think what you were trying to say is that mutations don't give us new information, except for when they do. Mutations can only take information that is already available and cause it to decay. Mutations are an example of a loss of genetic information. <laughs> You did it again! Mutations can add and take away information, and they do. And to say that mutations are a loss of genetic information is an out and out lie. Shame on you. I would have thought that a young earth creationist would know better than most that lying is a sin. Ta ta ta. Number five, English peppered moths. We're told that English peppered moths provide an example of evolution in action. Before the Industrial Revolution, the genetic information in the English peppered moth genome had genetic information for two varieties, light colored and dark colored, and after the genetic information was the same. English peppered moths simply do not prove evolution. So for number five, we're going with a proof of evolution to disprove evolution. <laughs> Genius. The pollution from the Industrial Revolution meant that the moths needed to evolve into a darker colour in order to survive, so birds couldn't see them on trees and that kind of thing. Which they did! Which is an example of evolution in action, you silly sausage! And number six, horse evolution. But this scenario is fabricated. It's not true. It was made up. In fact, more than 50 years ago, Dr. George Gaylord Simpson said, the uniform continuous transformation of Hyracotherium into Equus so dear to the hearts of generations of textbook writers never happened in nature. Okay, so for number six, you're gonna do exactly what you did for number five and use an example of evolution as a proof that evolution isn't real. <laughs> My word, and people have got the cheek to call me stupid. Now, Dr. George Simpson teaches evolution for a living, and are you honestly expecting people to take you serious when you try to use him to debunk the very thing 
that puts food on his table and he teaches evolution for a living. But that's an interesting way of doing this. It would be like me trying to debunk the flat earth by claiming that the earth was flat. Well, there we go. Another creationist who wouldn't know his ass from his elbow. Huge thanks to Forrest Gump for... Wait, did I just say Gump? I just edited that out. Sorry, Forrest Valkai. But yeah, thanks to Forrest for his help with this video. Thank you to these lovely people who all hit the super thanks button on the last video. Osman J, Mabitty Babity 7225, Wired Backwards 8114, and my dog Riley. You're all awesome. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Love you, bye. All right, all right, watch this next. But before you do, make sure you subscribe. By order of the creaky blinder.